Welcome everyone to the North Carolina Conference of Latin American Studies. This is an event that now can claim the history, a collaboration among Duke University, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Uh, North Carolina Conference on Latin American Studies one was celebrated in UNC two years ago. NC class two was scheduled to be celebrated last year at UNC Charlotte. Um, so we're not quite sure if this is UNC class two because number two was canceled because of the pandemic or this is NC class number three. So we could leave that for later discussion. Um, we are plunging into the unfamiliar world of a virtual conference, and we are pleased with the results. We have close to 400 people who have registered for a total of 10 panels, three roundtables, one plenary session, and one keynote address. Uh, an opportunity to acknowledge with appreciation the funders of NC Class 2, 3, uh, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Haskell Endowment of the Duke Office of Global Affairs, and the U.S. Department of Education. We acknowledge with appreciation the funders, and we acknowledge to at least as much the persons who have made this possible, this event possible. Anyone associated with hosting an event knows from the inside that conferences are the result of shared efforts and combined energies the experience and the expertise of many people. Successful conferences do not simply happen on their own. They are the result of planning and preparation, endlessly planning and preparation. And for that, we express the appreciation at Duke to Jennifer Prather and Miguel Rojas, and at UNC Chapel Hill, Joanna Schuett, Hannah Guild, Corinne Saragossa Estrella, Brianna Gilmore, and then we conscripted at the last minute, Kiera Hyman. And of course, and always, like master weavers, Beatrice Rico Muniz and Natalie Hartman, who with a sharp eye on the details and without ever losing sight of the vision, coordinate all the multiple moving parts to arrive at what will be a coherent and coordinated event. So on behalf of Dennis Clements from Duke and Jürgen Buchenau from UNC Charlotte, we welcome everyone to UNC, to North Carolina Conference of Latin American series number two, or maybe number three. In any case, welcome and my best wishes for a successful event in the coming day. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I have been working with the UNC Duke Consortium for 31 years. And over the years, one of our most important activities has been a collaboration with Duke University Press and, and UNC Press on the Latin America in Translation series. Today, we are excited to showcase the series by highlighting a title that is currently being translated and is scheduled to be in print within the next year or so. The book will be published by UNC Press and it is titled, To Hunt the Hunter in Chile, The Detectives Who Chase Down the Perpetrators of Crimes Against Humanity. We have with us here today, Elaine Maisner, Executive Editor of UNC Press, who has worked with us on the Latin America in Translation series for more than 25 years. We also have Peter Kornbluh, Director of the Cuba and Chile Documentation Projects at the National Security Archive in Washington, DC. And we also have the book's author, Pascal Bonafoy, a Chilean journalist and professor at the University of Chile um, the journalism school there. She has spent much of her professional career as a freelance reporter, correspondent, investigator, and producer for national and foreign media outlets, 
and documentary film productions and has specialized in human rights. We look forward to hearing more from them about this important project. Um, one last thing, we hope to have time for brief Q&A from the audience near the end of the session. If you would like to ask a question, please submit it via the Zoom Q&A function. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Lou. Really appreciate this spotlight on the important and important art of translation and the, the importance of translation itself. This is, I always call this series a jewel. It's very unusual in publishing to have money now stretching across 29 years um, to support translating Latin American and Caribbean voices into English. So um, I'm standing in here for Gisela Fosado, my counterpart at Duke University Press. We both serve on the Latin American Translation Editorial Committee, which meets once a year and puts out a call for proposals every year. Um, so lucky to have this money supported by the groups that Lou mentioned. And I think Mellon Foundation especially um, gives money for the translation. And what it does is give money to pay a translator. The, the presses undertake all the usual costs of publishing a book. But if one added on that extra money for paying the translator, um, the book would be, co the cost of it would be just, you know, priced beyond our readership. So that's why it's so important to have that extra subvention. Uh, so I wanna thank everyone in the program and Natalie and Jennifer, you've been wonderful um, over the years. And today we have, you know, because of, uh, I think Zoom, we're able to bring in our wonderful friends, Peter Kornblu, who recommended Pascal Bonafoy's book. And we're gonna turn this over to them in a minute. I just wanna highlight the series has published now 59 books over 29 years. So it's about two per year. Uh, both Duke and UNC have lists of all the books we've published on our website. So check it out, Latin American Translation. The first one came out in 92. And um, she's, um, Pascal's is coming out, uh, as Natalie mentioned, uh, this uh, fall 21. Is that what I said? Fall 22, sorry. Um, let's see, the, the, the book is being translated by Russ Davidson, who uh, has, has translated three previous books for us. He had an important librarianship job at the University of New Mexico for many years. He's retired and he's been able to do um, fantastic translations. So thank you, Russ, in case you're there. <laughs> Okay, um, I want to I want to turn this over now to um, well I did want to say a few things about the art of translation, but we can talk about that later maybe. I want to get this over to Peter, who comes to us from the National Security Archive and um, is a journalist and a wonderful writer. He's published a fantastic book with UNC Press called Back Channel to Cuba, and uh, Peter's going to talk about why he proposed this book for the series and and um, have some discussion, I think, with Pascal now. Okay, thank you, Peter, go ahead. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm Peter Kornblu from the National Security Archive. I'm really the proud nominator of this book, uh, To Hunt the Hunter, um, by my friend and longtime colleague, Pascal uh, Bonafoy, who I have believed for many, many years uh, deserves a uh, a broader audience in the United States, uh, even though as the longtime stringer in Chile for the New York Times, she, she does have um, a, a following and an, and an audience already. I, I personally, I have to say, I, I met uh, Pascal Bonafoy when uh, she, uh, in passing, when she was a college student at George Washington University, where my uh, office uh, now is at the time, almost, this is not quite 40 years ago, but 35 years ago or so in the mid 1980s, um, I was at the Institute for Policy Studies, a, a progressive think tank in Washington. Uh, Isabel Atelier was there, some other Chileans. Um, uh, and I, I met Pascal briefly then, but then about 20 years ago, I, I met her for real 
when she interviewed me for a, a small newspaper in, in Chile, I was in Chile. Um, I don't remember when my book, The Pinochet File, was coming out or, or uh, another smaller book that I published in Chile, but uh, she did an interview with me that was really great. Um, and from that moment on, uh, steadily for at least 20 years now, um, we've been friends, we've been collaborators, we've been uh, co-authors on, on articles uh, over the years. Um, Pascal is an incredibly unique combination of, uh, of, of a great storyteller, incredibly wonderful uh, and, and detailed and meticulous investigator, um, and, uh, uh, and um, a, a truly decent uh, person um, who understands the United States very well and understands her own country of Chile. She understands the United States because she spent many years here. Uh, she's completely bilingual. Um, and um, she's had, her father's lived here for, for many years. Uh, so um, she is a, just a, a, a kind of a cross-border writer. Uh, and she's already done three uh, uh, interesting books at this point. Um, the one that's being translated to Hunt the Hunter is the third book. Her first book was on the horrors of, the, of, of what went on in the national stadium in the days, follow, the days and weeks following the coup when the Ch Chilean military under Pinochet turned at the, the major soccer stadium into a, a torture and execution center. She did another extraordinary uh, book that, that few people in the United States know about, uh, which was um, uh, almost, it was a, a narrative and a photography book about uh, Chilean exiles, uh, most of whom were, had taken exile in Cuba, uh, and, and then were um, pressed into kind of soldiering uh, into Nicaragua to, to, to help the Sandinistas uh, wage the revolutionary insurrection against, against Somoza in the late 1970s. Um, and, and that book uh, is a book that merits a lot of attention. And then she wrote this book about the a special team of detectives uh, who uh, have been pursuing um, crimes against humanity. Um, and she's finishing a fourth book, which is very dear to my heart, about um, a mutual friend of ours, a young man named Rodrigo Rojas, who grew up in, in Washington in exile with his mother, his Chilean mother, went back to Chile um, in 1986, and, and within weeks was um, detained by the Chilean military during a protest, um, set on fire and, and, and killed. Um, so I'm awaiting her fourth book with great anticipation um, because it's a very important book. Why did I nominate this book? I had three very clear reasons. One is it takes a very novel approach to the discussion of human rights, transitional justice, uh, and uh, uh, the pursuit of, of truth and justice and accountability for crimes against humanity. There are a lot of books out there on, on human rights. There are books on, on accountability. There are books on, 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 on trials. There's um, theoretical books. Um, but this is a, an investigative book about investigators. Uh, and it's, it's so unique in its approach to, to this issue. Um, uh, that I thought it, it deserved uh, attention in, in the United States uh, and, a, and a much broader um, uh, and a much broader uh, readership than, than just being in, in Spanish. The second reason uh, that I nominated it was because Pascal has used these extraordinary uh, sources for the book. She not only uh, gained the trust of the actual detectives, uh, that were doing this work, but she gained access to their investigative files. And for anybody who's kind of been a sleuth like uh, a good, good, good writing it can it can in, involves real you know real investigation. You have to become a detective yourself. And here was uh, Pascal Bonafoy, a journalistic detective, um, uh, focusing, following, uh, recording. Um, the history of the detective work that had gone on in Chile uh, to try and hold human rights violators accountable. And the third reason I, I, I really like this book 
uh, is because even though it's being published and translated by an academic press, a very enlightened academic press, I might add, it is an, not an academically written book. It's an accessible journalistic account. And Pascal is nothing but, uh, is nothing but an extraordinary uh, journalist. Um, and all of her skills and talents and narrative and storytelling skill, uh, talents are represented in the way she's presented this, this material. And so I think it, that will make it accessible to a, to a broad audience, multi-generational, multinational. Um, and I think the book will do very well and be an important contribution to our understanding of, of how uh, human rights criminals are, are held uh, are held accountable, are investigated, how the truth is put out there, even if sometimes the courts, as has been the case in Chile, don't don't uh, fully uh, act on 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 the evidence. I'm honored to have nominated the book. I'm honored to be on this panel with all of you, but particularly Pascal Bonafoy. So I, I now yield to her to to share with us uh, the book itself. Hi everyone. Um, well, thank you, Peter, for <laughs> such an enthusiastic presentation. Thank you, Elaine, Natalie, and everyone else here um, for inviting me, for highlighting the, the Latin American translation series and my book in particular, which happens to be translated this year. <laughs> um, and I would like to say, I think what Peter was saying is right um, in the sense of appealing to a broader public not only because it's not an academic work and it's not like it's not academic language it's journalistic it has you know some sort of chronicling uh you know life stories true detective stories etc but also um it will appeal to to scholars in a sense that it's a different angle on post-dictatorship transitions or political transitions in general um every every country has a way of dealing with its past and they're very different. Um, I think in Latin America, I don't know if US readers or public in general are aware of what happened in the 1980s, especially in, in, in Chile's case in the 1990s, with how, how they dealt with their military regimes, um, human rights violations and crimes, but not, not just that, just how to transition from, from an authoritarian state to uh, a democracy, and it's it's not easy, and it's not automatic, and it takes a lot a lot of time with a lot of constraints. And in Latin America, there's been very different experiences. Um, my book, of course, focuses only on Chile, and Chile often has been showcased as a, a, a kind of a, a model or an example, a good example, positive example of a peaceful transition from the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet. Who ruled in 1973 to 1990 um, to a democracy with many, many limitations. Um, so many that in two months from now, we're going to have our first election of a constituent assembly to rewrite Pinochet's constitution 40 years later, 40 de four decades. So, I mean, that's how long all of this has taken. Um, some countries in Latin America have had truth commissions decades later. Chile set one up within its first year. Um, some have had public trials, as in Argentina, um, in which even though they were all later amnestied, at least they were public. The culprits, the responsible for crimes against humanity were put on a public stage and they and, and witnesses and, and victims had to talk about and, and air and all of this, of course, was televised, um, what had truly happened. In Brazil, there's been practically nothing. Uruguay, very little. Um, and Chile had a kind of mix. Um, it had a truth commission, but a truth commission is never enough. And it had very, very timid, limited investigations of the crimes, which is what my book is about. Um, within a framework of, of multiple restraints with Pinochet, the former dictator, still as commander in chief of the army, exerting influence, um, complaining every, every day about something or another, always having his say, um, sending troops to the streets when something didn't, when he didn't like it, when his son was being investigated, et cetera. Um, it didn't have public trials. It never has had 
public human rights trials, which hasn't been very healthy for the country. I mean, for a transition, for a democracy, um, all of the human rights investigations were dealt with in a very antiquated, secret judicial system, which fortunately has been reformed, but not for the human rights cases, which remained in the old system. So no one, I mean, all of this was not televised. Some of it, of course, was covered in the press, but this was a very kind of secret process, very not, not public. So that means that to this day, there are many people who still question what happened here, still question the truth and say it's um, relative, it's your interpretation, these, these alleged crimes didn't exist, um, that's the way you see it, and they don't claim it as a historical fact. Um, my book, is, as Peter said, has a novel approach in that I take it from the perspective, the point of view of the detectives who actually went out to investigate these crimes. Originally, I wanted to write a book about the young generation of detectives today, who are very young, who were most of them were born after dictatorship, who are investigating these cold cases and what they were doing. So I, I saw myself going, going out with them, you know, to exhumations, interviewing old criminals, etc. Um, and then when I started, you know, as a researcher, investigated, I wanted to always, of course, go to the origin of everything, go to like the, how did all of this happen? Um, because most people in Chile and outside of Chile believe that human rights investigations in Chile began after the year 1998 or 2000 when Pinochet, the dictator, was uh, apprehended in London be awaiting an extradition request from a Spanish judge who wanted to try him for Spanish victims in Chile. Um, but this, this started almost immediately with the transition and with President Elwin's Truth Commission. Um, these detectives, and I'm talking about two men, literally two men, <laughs> then there were three, then there were four, um, then there was a small unit. They started investigating crimes when their own institution, the director was on board with this, but many in their own institution were still um, loyal to Pinochet, were still torturing in their own units. They were, there was torture in the detective force until about 1993, 94. Um, and there was a process, of course, in which the investigations police, which was the only, the only institution that the civilian government was able to intervene because it couldn't intervene Carabineros, which is the militarized police, couldn't intervene the army, the military, the air force, but it did um, intervene the investigations police by putting uh, its own appointee as director of the force. And he in turn opened this little unit to investigate human rights crimes. So um, it's, a, it's, it's a focus on the transition through what these detectives did with all the problems and all the limitations they had, limitations in terms, political limitations because of the government, political forces that were always finding a way or looking for a way to, um, um, kind of negotiate or at least strike a balance with the right wing, with the military, with opposing forces. Um, so it's, it's it was always this, you know, let's go a couple of steps ahead and then one, one back. Um, but it also had its own uh, restraints from the judicial system, which was not reformed um, for another eight years or so, or 10 years or so. And these judges, even though the police would investigate human rights crimes, these judges, would still amnesty them, would still close them. Um, so there wasn't a correlation between human rights investigations and actual sentencing, or actually even knowing the truth of what had happened. Um, and of course it had resistance from its own internal opposition within the, the detective force and opposition from the military and the army intelligence department in particular, which was hounding them basically um, and obstructing their investigations. So um, if you don't mind, I, I'd like to read just a few minutes from uh, the first chapter of the book, which kind of lays the scenario of what happens later in the book, which is about you know how they went after certain criminals and investigated certain cases. The first uh, chapter begins with a very well-known case probably in the United States. I mean, those were Latin American scholars may be familiar with the assassination of Orlando Letelier, 
who was the Chilean ambassador in Chile during the Allende government. And then he was um, later a leader in exile in Washington, DC, and actually was working at IPS that Peter mentioned. And he was assassinated in 1976 in Washington, DC um, by the DINA. DINA was the secret service agency headed by Manuel Contreras and his second in command was Pedro Espinosa. So these two men um, in 1991, uh, due to a long story that's too long to explain, <laughs> but had a lot to do with United States pressure. The Letelier investigation was actually reopened in Chile almost immediately after, after dictatorship. And these detectives, and a new, a new judge was appointed and he tasked these detectives to go detain these two men. They were living, you know, retired, nice lives in the countryside in the South. They had to detain them and bring them to him uh, in Santiago to be indicted. This was something like people really didn't know about. So that's kind of the backdrop of what I'm about to read now. Um, this is Russ Davidson's magnificent translation. It says, Patricio Elwin's term in office swung on continuous pendulum of friction, collisions and negotiations both formal and secret over the new political and constitutional system, legal reforms, the influence and role of the military in a democracy and the sensitive barbed question of what to do about the crimes of the past. The Letelier case stirred up the latent doubt over the question of just how far a judge could go in pursuing an investigation of people inside the ex-dictator's most trusted circle. Much less attention, however, was given to whether detectives from the investigations police an institution that still wasn't fully purged of Pinochet loyalists would be able to carry out their work unhampered or assert authority over military officials who enjoyed the backing of their commander in chief, Pinochet, the person ultimately responsible for the crimes that were committed. In exchange for leaving the presidency and allowing a peaceful transition to civilian rule, General Pinochet set forth his own demands. In August, 1989, a few months prior to the general elections that buried his dictatorship, but still the master of the country, Pinochet laid down the hard lines that the new government could not cross if it hoped to govern peacefully. In short, no meddling with the nation's current economic model or his men or his family. Regarding human rights, Pinochet had established four imperatives, keeping in force the amnesty law of 1978, respecting the authority of the military justice system, which continued to claim jurisdiction over human rights cases only to later close them or leave them in an indefinite legal limbo. Uh, and I quote, ensure order and the prestige of the armed forces and prevent any attempts at reprisal against its members for political reasons, end quote. In the logic of the military and for those who supported the military's reign, to investigate crimes committed by agents of the state and subject them to imprisonment were politically mo motivated reprisals against patriots who in 1973 risked their lives to lift the country out of ruin and a reestablish civic order only because Chileans clamored for it. It was outrageous, dishonorable, and indeed no less than unjustified persecution that true heroes might have to appear in court when the fault lay in the lies propagated by international communism. A war had been fought to save the country and in wars, there are always losses. The incidental excesses of a mere handful of people could not be used to condemn an entire institution. And finally, it was the price to pay for civic peace and for the successful market economy that the armed forces in tandem with a visionary business class had bestowed on the country. President Patricio Elwin's government was navigating through turbulent waters and its mission, especially during its first few years, was to stabilize the ship. A series of critical questions dogged it. How to reconcile the democratization of the country with the political, legal, and constitutional restraints left in place by the regime and supported by an obstructive right-wing opposition? How to live with an illegitimate and authoritarian constitution that nevertheless allowed him, Elwin, to take office and in consequence, he was committed to respect? How to achieve the full subordination of the military to civil authority and at the same time, fulfill the desire for truth and justice? how to satisfy enormous and varied expectations and social demands and deal with the groups exercising de facto power while simultaneously ensuring governability along with economic stability, 
It was a titanic task on multiple fronts and there was almost always one in crisis. The armed forces preserved spheres of power and influence in the new system, which could not yet be called democratic, and they continued to play a political role, intervening in all sorts of issues. A government report in, in June 1990 called attention to the fact that, I quote, the army is a key political actor in the process of transition, like it or not, end quote. The military had not completely returned to their barracks, and amid this protected or supervised democracy, the government ended up backing off every time Pinochet pounded the table. That's an excerpt. That, I think that lays kind of the, the, the backdrop of <laughs> the whole human rights issue, at least during the first, I would say, seven, eight years of democracy. Um, I can talk about what, um, how I went about investigating this. Um, as Peter mentioned, I was able to get access after many meetings with, with the, um, the investigations police about um, having access to their file. These weren't the legal files. It, this wasn't a judicial case. Um, so it wasn't the legal file a court would have. These are the files of police reports. These are the files of well, there were two sorts of files, one on cases and how they went about investigating them and um, and the statements from the witnesses, but also what they were doing, um, getting permission to travel to Brazil after one of the criminals or to Paraguay or to Uruguay or to the United States also. Um, and that on the one hand, and on the other hand, the oh. internal, archive about how the police was actually going through its own purging process and own reforms, um, which was very interesting. And it gave me a completely different take on Chile's transition, um, which I've always been very critical of. Um, I, I know a lot of people say it's, it's a model because it was peaceful, et cetera, et cetera. But I've always been very critical of uh, Chile's transition in that um, I always thought that more could be done, especially you know, limiting the army's power and investigating human rights cases and actually getting justice for them, not 40 or 50 years later, but soon. Um, but this gave me kind of a different perspective on what was actually happening kind of behind um, behind the scenes, because this this story, this, this police story, this is a real true detective story, uh, no one really knew about at the time, um, just a few press reports, but not that there was a whole intention supported by the government to actually amass a universe of information, of evidence um, in human rights crimes that could be used to prosecute. Um, the problem was that no one was, not, not no one, but very few people were prosecuted, indicted, and sentenced before. Um, in, within the first decade. Um, I'll stop here in, 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 if, if you want to ask or, or actually we can have some time later on to take uh, questions from attendees. Well, I'd be interested to ask you to talk a little bit about how you got access to the archives mm -hmm. and uh, would be happy to hear Peter talk a little bit about working with archives as well, which I think should be of interest to a lot of the participants in this uh, session. Um, mm -hmm. and, and also you must tell us about at least one very dangerous situation you found yourself in. <laughs> which? I don't know. Did you find yourself uh, threatened if by I, anyone? No, 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 no. No, you know, um, well, first on the archives, as I said, I had to ask for permission um, and I went to several meetings. Um, they didn't really know me. I mean, I think, I mean, because of my book on the National Stadium, I had gone to the investigations police many, many, many times to um, contribute statements or in information or evidence on National Stadium victims. So I, at least my name was kind of familiar, but I, I didn't really know them. So I kind of just ins insisted. And the interesting thing was that this archive well, first, this archive is like very, um, they're like really old yellowing folders and they were all piled up in a tiny closet. I mean, you don't don't think of it as the National Archive in, the, in Washington. Um, and 
at that time, they were, uh, the detective force was actually uh, applying for status as a historical monument for those archives. So as to get funds to be able to, able to um, scan them, digitalize them and actually put them in order, et cetera. So, and, and if they were to do that, it was because they were going to go public. So I actually landed in the perfect time, perfect period in which they were still kind of unsure of whether these archives were public or not, because they were cases that were already closed, most of them. Actually, I didn't get access to some of the cases that were not closed yet. Um, so in, in, in theory, they should be public, but they were actually not because no one had looked at them before. So finally, I mean, consulting with their legal department, they decided they, I could have access to them. And um, th their human rights brigade is in a huge old house. And the, the archive, as I said, is in a closet, basically. A closet that has a lot of many shelves and a little tiny um, desk. So I would sit at the desk, what do you wanna see? And they would bring the box or the folder to me. And then after about, and I, I sat there for many weeks. So just after a few days, it was like, just um, shut the door and, and, and you know turn off the lights when you leave. So <laughs> for the first week, someone was always next to me and pulling the files out. And then later they would like serve me some coffee and just you know turn off the light and make sure the door's locked when you leave. So I actually got to like rummage around everything, even the stuff that I wasn't supposed to look at, but no one knows that <laughs> except you guys now. <laughs> um, and eventually the, this archive was declared a national or historic monument and it is now actually being uh, digitalized. And, and I think I kind of opened the door for researchers or investigators or journalists to have access to these files. Um, I mean, I set a precedent in that, yes, they, they were public. I didn't go through the transparency law, which is our, our equivalent of FOIA. Uh, I just did it, you know, personally. Um, and as for, no, I, I went through no dangerous situations at all. And actually these detectives, which were all, I mean, except two, they were all in retire, retirement. They're retired by now. They were really happy. I mean, a couple didn't talk to me, didn't want to talk to me for different reasons, but all of them, the rest were really happy because it was the first time that someone was gonna tell their story and they feel really proud about what they did. Um, and they haven't been acknowledged because they were just fulfilling their mission. I mean, this, that's what detectives do, investigate. So, but they knew that it was a special sort of investigation. It was actually, um, an invest these were investigations to establish a historical truth. So it was a huge responsibility on them. They did it with a really strong commitment, um, sleeping little, eating little, very few resources and very few people, men, there, there, was, there were no women at first. Um, so they were proud of what they did. So they were really actually happy to, to help me. And I got one, I think one of my, um, I got the former director who was director of the forest for 10 years to sit down with me many, many times at his home. And he didn't, he doesn't talk to journalists. So, so that was a big plus on my side. And he, he told me a lot of what had gone on also. I think you mentioned to me once that this was, this investigation was going on. Pinochet was no longer president, but he was still in charge of the armed forces, right? Pinochet was still in charge of the armed forces and he was, um, you know, my internet is a little unstable. So sometimes I freeze or you freeze. So if I'm okay. stuck, it's, it's because of my internet. Pinochet remained as commander in chief of the armed force of the army until 1998. And then he was allowed to become senator for life. Um, this is all established through his own constitution. So that's what I was saying originally that, um, Chile's transition was negotiated and part of the negotiation was to respect Pinochet's timetable in the constitution and that allowed him to be commander in chief. So he was always, I wouldn't even say in the shadows, he was very visible for at least the first eight years. And then he, he stepped down. Um, the new commander in chief of the army was much younger. So I think there were like several generations that were wiped out or eliminated. 
uh, not physically. <laughs> and then um, he was allowed to become senator for life. Basically, through his constitution, what he did was to guarantee himself immunity from prosecution forever. So he had immunity as former head of state, then he had immunity as commander in chief of the army, and then he was going to have immunity as a senator. He went to the Senate, I don't know, two or three times. It was a huge scandal, ridiculous. Uh, he never really went, and then he had this really bad idea, idea of going to London. Actually, it wasn't his idea. He was tasked by the government, by the democratic government that he had persecuted, um, to negotiate weapons deals with um, the British military industry, which we had a really good relationship with. So he went on a diplomatic passport, and he was detained there because when a Spanish or when Chileans and you know people like Juan Garcés um, in Spain got a hold of the news that he was in London, they immediately asked for his arrest and extradition from the Spanish justice system. And that was, well, my book ends there, huh? but that was when there was a flood of human rights cases opened because the untouchable was touched. You know, his, his kind of aura of protection was um, was in shambles. And when other countries started to ask for Binochet's extradition, um, and then President Frey at the time said, you know, bring him, send him home and we'll try him here. And no one really wanted Binochet to come home. They wanted him in Spain because 10 years had passed and he had never been tried. So they wanted actually to, for him to be tried in Spain. But since, since Great Britain sent him to Chile, um, the government was forced basically to, and, and the courts, which had just recently gone undergone these reforms. Yeah, I know Peter has a lot to say about this. Um, finally, they were able to investigate him um, freely. And, and there were hundreds, I, mean, I would say over 300 human rights cases or human rights lawsuits filed against him when he was sent home in the year 2000. Um, and all of this universe of evidence that these detectives had gathered for a decade were put to use. And that's how Peter Cornblue and I met. <laughs> that's, <good. laughs> that's, that's exactly how we met because when- when Pino, uh, Pinochet brought us together. Yeah, because when, when uh, he was in London and you know other countries started asking for his extradition, the US government didn't, but decided to declassify um, thousands of documents about the Pinochet dictatorship. And so when they were declassified, uh, somehow, and I could read English, <laughs> I started reporting on the documents and I started dealing with uh, Peter Kornblu, who ended up always giving me tips when, when juicy documents were about to be released. <laughs> Pascal, um, you know, it, the, the importance of your work uh, and the importance of these documents and getting these documents out Certainly, uh, certainly points to the issue of the verdict of, of history uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to courtroom verdicts. And I've always believed that the verdict of history is extremely important. And even though it's very frustrating when you can't get Pinochet prosecuted and convicted in a court and others under him, um, at least you have the, the record uh, for the next mm -hmm. generation of people working on this. And I'm I'm interested to know, I think many people listening here are interested to know what, what the impact of your book was when it came out in Chile, what the discussion in the press was, uh, what some of the retired detectives had to say, um, whether you were pursued, pressured, persecuted, lauded, applauded, all those things. We don't have that much time left, but give us a sense of, of how the book was received in Chile. Mm -hmm. I think what was most um, highlighted was that, <clears throat> you know, President Elwin always spoke about justice in, uh, in la medida de lo posible, which is in so far as possible, something like that. Um, and the, the book showed that much more was done than what the public actually knew. But I think what was most um, interesting also is the, the detective forces internal reforms, which the Carabineros has never had to this day. So now we're seeing um, serious human rights crimes being committed by the police today by a force that was never purged, never reformed, never intervened, never really put under civilian um, authority to this day. 
So um, this book is actually kind of um, very um, adequate for today's discussion when there is pressure to for an overall reform of the Carabineros police. Um, when you see what happened to the detective force, it took them two years, three years for a massive reform, which Carabineros has never had. Um, I think more though, and it was interesting because um, I thought there were so many other things about the book that made it interesting, but I think most of the focus was, you know, on how hard it was for the detectives to arrest the former heads of the DINA um, and, uh, you know, what was going on within the detective force. Um, you know, there was someone I was asking a question and um, I would be interested to know whether the cases in this book include cries crimes against indigenous peoples in Chile. No, because the actual book isn't about the crimes themselves. It's about how the, the, the um, detectives investigated them. So um, I highlight only a few, I highlight some of the criminals more than the crimes. Um, so for example, could be uh, responsible for crimes against indigenous people in the Tamuco area, for example. And I mentioned crimes in indigenous areas against the Mapuche um, after the coup. But the book doesn't really go into the crimes, um, only briefly. So no, there's nothing particular about indigenous peoples there. Mm -hmm. well, let I don't me know ask if anyone... Let me ask oh. another question, which is uh, you, have, uh, you have a couple of scenes in the book of, of Dean officials and Contreras himself being arrested. And um, mm -hmm. those were, in a sense, moments of accountability. He ended up in prison. The head of the Chilean secret police ended up in prison for a long time, died uh, in a, a luxury prison, uh, uh, for sure. But um, what, what are these scenes in, in, from your book where the detectives actually go and confront these guys and say, guess what? You're, you don't have the military behind you anymore. We're actually going to take you and arrest you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the, the, there's a lot of interesting scenes because um, the military intelligence uh, service department was following day by day what the detectives are doing, not only following them physically, but also, I mean, they were actually, you know, vi vigilante, but they were also preparing the people who had to go to court or to the police to make a statement, they prepare, they prepped them. And there was a, there's a funny scene in the detective because um, he, he started noticing that every time the military, uh, some military official came to make a statement, they would like talk about the weather. I mean, they would, they would always say, you know, talk louder, talk louder. And they would like sit in a certain way. And then he figured out that they were actually, they had tape recorders on them. Um, and that they would be transcribed later in the Army Intelligence Department office um, so as to see how much the detectives knew, et cetera. So they started changing tactics and started interrogating these guys in um, a basement room that had a really like loud ventilator. And then the detective, since you know they were all using cassettes that were only 30 to 45 minutes per side um, and they couldn't switch them, uh, they would talk about the weather and talk about this and that and oh, where did you grow up and blah, 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 just, you know, stretch out the tape. Um, a lot of that kind of thing happened, but more serious things happened also. There were, there were detectives who were followed, who were, um, you know, dead cats were thrown on their doorsteps, um, who received death threats. And um, yeah, I mean, the, a lot of them... Um, they, 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 it wasn't nice. I mean, a lot of them kind of burned out. Um, there was one who was very young. He started at age 24 to investigate. All, I think he started actually with, with La Moneda, with, with the coup itself and the crimes committed there. Um, and he burned out. I mean, he actually was, at, he asked to be transferred to Easter Island after a few years because they, they, it was too much because not only because of the pressure from the military, but also because of spending, I don't know, 15 hours a day listening to tragedy, um, tragic stories and drama. Um, and then on the other, something that, that, that's really interesting to mention also um, is that apart from all these limitations and pressure they had, 
one other obstacle they had were the actual victims and the relatives and the human rights groups that didn't trust them. I mean, how can you trust a detective force that a year before was torturing you, you know? So they really, I mean, and, and, and you have to, you know, give credit to a few women, I mean, literally a few, two or three, three women um, who were actually, who had been political prisoners who said, you know, no, I mean, just let's give it a shot, let's help, let's contribute. And they started like rounding up their own people and, you know, trying to encourage them to actually work with the police to establish the truth. Um, and that was, that was really hard. They weren't trusted. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions there for you that you see? No, I don't see other questions here. Mm -hmm. Feel free to offer any questions. We have a couple of minutes left. Okay, uh, Natalie, I think we have wanted to speak about the art of translation. Yeah, I, I did have um, w one thing that's I've learned over the years, um, and I'm not sure if attendees work in the area of translation. I mean, I'm sure all scholars who are using, um, you know, rich sources in original languages do to some degree. Um, but when we're publishing books, we try to have the translator not do um, just a simple, very straightforward, stilted word by word translation. And I mean, there's, there's lots of thought and philosophy about translation. Um, but generally speaking, doing a strict word by word translation doesn't really render um, a text into another language. In, in the end, being strictly uh, loyal to particular uh, verbatim um, translations can end up actually, you know, rendering a language that is not getting across what the original did. And so that's important to remember. And in the case of Pascal's book, we uh, w worked with Russ uh, through, uh, of course, he picked it up very quickly, but we had to make it sound more like a John le Carré novel, <laughs> that idea, than, you know, a word by word translation. So mm -hmm. that's something we we uh, always think about. Let's see, I think it looks like there's another, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, Beatrice, I think, has a question. Um, oh, she wants to know what project, what new work you're working on right now. I think Peter mentioned it earlier, but maybe you could talk about it a little yeah. bit. And I'm not supposed to, Peter, so. <laughs> okay. I'm turning in the manuscript next month. Um, it's... I have a, a, a little ways to go, but it is it is a kind of biography, a very contextualized contextualized um, biography of a young man who was killed in Chile, who was who was living in exile. So it's um, it's kind of an, I'm I'm trying to look for like different optics on on Chilean's recent history. So yeah, as Peter mentioned before, there were so many books on human rights. Um, this one, actually, I have it here. This is the Spanish. Um, this is a different angle on it. So it, it, it contributes. And, and what I want to do with this upcoming book or what I'm doing is also trying to like shed light on different aspects of living under dictatorship, but living in a very political family, the impact of exile on a young man <laughs> who's actually grew up more outside of Chile than in Chile, reasons for coming back, um, what he did here, I mean, what he, how, how Chile in 1986 was seen from the eyes of a young man who had spent 10 years in exile and basically kind of trace his steps to the point where he was actually killed. Uh, what could explain that he was there at that place at that time under those circumstances. Um, not that got him killed because there's no justification, but 
why he was there. Um, and he ended up being burned alive by the military in Chile. So it's also like a different kind of angle mm -hmm. on like recent history through the eyes of, or through, through a family history, basically. Um, I think we're, would you say just a brief word about uh, how you're, you know, how you feel about having your work translated for a Anglophone audience and how important is it to people, to scholars and writers and journalists in Latin America to have their work heard in mm -hmm. uh, translation by a broader audience? What's mm -hmm. the attitude toward that? Well, actually, um, I had, Peter has mentioned it to me for years. You should get your books translated. Um, and now that one is actually being translated um, and, and in parentheses, it's been a really interesting process with Russ because um, we, we've been going back and forth with this translation because there's so many like Chilenismos that sometimes go by or just very like, dry kind of legal technical terminology that we have to somehow make it real <laughs> but um I think there are so many stories so many things going on in in Latin America that uh a U.S. readers or U.S. public don't are, are unaware of so most of what like people in the United States what they read about Latin America is written by Latin America uh, by United States scholars um and of course you know academics, journalists, other researchers come to Latin America, interview people, um, go back with their material and draft their reports or books, but, but it's different. It's different to have like Latin Americans tell their story and usually find stories that are different than what the typical researcher can do in two months, six months time in a country that he or she isn't really all that familiar with. Um, and especially if if they don't really manage the language as well, because you have to rely on a translator, which which is always difficult and always maybe, you know, may may not be true to to what people are saying. So I think it's extremely important for Latin Americans to um, tell their own stories outside of the country. And I mean, I see it the other way around. I know there's so many things written in different languages that I can't read that I would love to. You know, um, because I pr I would prefer a native of whatever Hungary to um, to tell me what happened in Hungary in 1956, for example, and not a U.S. scholar or a Latin American scholar. <laughs> um, so I think that's the point. Good one. Well, we're all waiting for the book. No, me too. <laughs> I'm very grateful for the opportunity to have this translated. I'm extremely grateful. Well, I like the leaving this session, this panel, with uh, the idea that Latin Americans and people from the Caribbean should have, have their own voices and stories heard worldwide. So mm -hmm. thank you so much, Pascal. We really appreciate your participation. Peter, thank you so much for doing the work you do and for introducing.